So I'd love to introduce our first speaker who's going to really set the scene for us today. Graham Anderson is a science communi communicator and extension leader uh, within the Agricultural Victoria sector. He leads a team who delivers climate risk services to help farmers and advisors to make sense of the issues associated with climate change and how they can adopt locally their farming systems. So he's going to really set the scene with what is actually happening with the climate in this area and what is it that drives change. So thank you, Graham, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thanks for coming today to everyone online and who's here. And um, thank you for the, the Shire and Port Phillip Westport CMA for organising this great event. Um, it's been in the news a lot, this issue of climate change, carbon, and really in the end, I'm going to just go through and, and just sort of point out this, this point in time in history we're at. And it really is in our hands what happens in the next 10, 20 years. And so I'll set the scene with the science. And one of the key things is, one of the key assets we have is just as people getting together, working this out as we go. That's all we've ever uh, that's how any change has ever happened. So thanks for your attendance and, and involvement today. So, um, you know, fantastic day. It's not blowing a gale. I mean, it's interesting. It's quite wet at the moment and people would think it's a traditional Victorian winter. I've got here just some rainfall uh, from a, a lovely little climate app that um, has lots of locations on it. It's a good site, but it shows here from the 12 month rainfall and all of the, the rainfall records for uh, Red Hill South. And then this red line is how we're tracking this year. So we're right on average. Um, so th this year, um, even though it probably feels a bit wetter at the minute. If you look at the last five years, you can just see, well, we're sort of tracking below par. And that's pretty well the same for any other place we would go to in Victoria. So it's good this year and it'll keep raining in future. But if you look over the longer term, it's a bit drier. Um, if we, just skipping a slide there, um, I might have skipped, thank you, yeah, so um, there's a really good brochure by the, the Bureau of Meteorology which, which looks at the, the last 30 years of climate and temperature trends for each region um, of Australia and compares that to, to previous and I guess what we're sort of seeing and this is, you know, Mornington long term rainfall, you can see here a millennium drought and, you know, that in the last sort of, uh, you know, 30 years, it's been drier 12 times and we still have wet years, but there's been less of them. So we'll talk a little bit about what's behind that because th we have that in common with lots of other parts of South East Australia. Um, and also the other thing I've noticed is just this increasing temperature pattern, which I'll get to because we'll talk about what's behind that increasing in temperatures and more variability. So it's a great little guide, those bomb climate guides to um, uh, update on where we are now. And this is just temperature trends from across southeastern Australia for summer, autumn, uh, winter and spring. And you can just sort of see, we have a lot of variability from year to year. Some years where there's a lot of cloud and it's wetter, it's obviously colder. And so for this spring, it, it'll probably be pretty close to long-term average or a bit cooler even. Um, but you can just sort of see there's that broader trend there that's going up. And one thing I would point out is um, uh, you can just sort of see spring. You know, in the last 10 years, we've had a number of springs that are between 2 and 3 degrees warmer than average. So that's really the arrival of summer a month earlier from a temperature point of view. And if we look at uh, largely one of the key things with, with um, the, the strongest part of the climate science is that that warming trends and we're squeezing in extra months of summer. So we'll still have variability in seasons. Some summers will be wet, some won't be. But on the top of it, you know, over, over the coming decades, December temperatures will appear in November or they'll appear uh, even sooner. And, and the same then in the autumn, like we extend those summer temperatures into the autumn season. So that's a pretty big one. If you can think of it as just dealing with all of the seasonal variability that farming contend with. So it leads us to this point. Um, this is, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean measured at the top of Mauna Loa. And you can see the annual fluctuation. It's only parts per million and a lot of people say to me, you know, is it really impacting stuff? And 
um, sometimes things don't need to be in really strong concentration to have a big impact. And if you think if, if this was salinity into your farm dam and you knew it was going up three parts per million a year, uh, you know that at some point there would be a reckoning. And, and it's not a straight reckoning all of a sudden one day. It's a gradually you're getting yourself into a trickier situation, which is pretty well what happens here. Now, carbon dioxide, of course, we breathe it out. It's not a toxic gas unless we're in a room of 100% of it because we'd get no oxygen. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of people say, you know, carbon dioxide, what, what's the problem? Um, and I guess I like to tell the story of back to the 1850s. So this is, you know, when the gold rush was happening here in Australia, there's some clever cookies. Um, uh, Eunice Foote, a famous scientist um, in, in the US, and then John Tyndall um, uh, over in uh, um, England. And they had sort of worked out, we get energy from the sun during the day. And, you know, just imagine on, like on the dashboard of a car, the sun hits it and it warms it up. So we've got that warmth that's absorbed during the day. But then when the sun sets, that heat should just radiate back out to space. And so these clever cookies had worked out that, you know what, when we wake up in the morning, um, it's, it should be about 30 degrees colder than it is. Something is not letting all of that heat escape at night. So, and I often joke, I grew up near Ballarat and I thought some mornings all of the heat had escaped <laughs> overnight. Um, as stood at the bus stop with an icy puddle. Um, but, but really interesting that they're saying, so something in the atmosphere is trapping that heat. So what is it? So the experiment uh, was getting their gases from the atmosphere and then passing heat radiation through them. And so uh, John Tyndall was just saying, well, you know, over 98% of the atmosphere is just either nitrogen gas or oxygen gas. So he took out what he called the impurities and then passed the heat through those gases. And so all the heat went through the oxygen gas. So he said, well, it's not it. And all the heat went through the nitrogen gas. So he said, wow. So if our atmosphere was just those two gases, it would, we would freeze every night. So back to the impurities and went to test them and the heat did not come out the other side of those gases. They just trapped the heat. So it's actually laws of physics and they haven't changed since 1850. Um, and the, the basic theory was, well, the more we put of those up there, the more they're going to trap heat. And the analogy I often use with a car, imagine two cars parked on a sunny day. They're both getting the same sunlight. Both dashboards are heating up. But imagine if uh, one of the cars has the windows down and one of the cars has the windows up. You'll know when you go to sit in that car at the end of the day, there'll be a difference. So the one with the windows down, the energy that's being absorbed on the dashboard and then radiated out can get out. So you've got sort of a, a stability there. In, in the one with the windows up, uh, you know, it's, it's got to get a much higher temperature before it finds its new equilibrium. So we're in the process of winding the windows up on the, on the planet. And we've not wound them up all the way yet. We've wound them probably halfway up and it, there's been a lot of noise and we've had a lot of discussion the last 20 years about are we going to really tackle this? And I guess that's the challenge that's in front of us now. <coughs> we know with a lot of the modelling that's been done and uh, as, you know, globally and it with Australia that you can only replicate the increases in temperatures when you put in the increased greenhouse gases that trap heat into the climate models. And basically from here on everything goes up. Um, the big question is how much future temperatures rise is really about, well, how much emissions we put in the atmosphere. So the emissions already there will keep trapping heat, but it's also really important how much more we add to that. So this is Victoria's climate projections, and this is um, the black line is, is a, a temperature for the last 100 years. It goes out for a couple of hundred years to the future, but it just shows the projections here. And this is this point in time in history between low emissions future or if we keep going on the traditional path. And it doesn't, a lot of the time the figures are talked about at what the, the warming by 2100, but uh, a high emissions future doesn't stop at 2100. So in terms of, you know, there's 8 billion of us on the planet, this is a real test for us. We've got all the ingredients to actually do this, but we could mess it up as well. And 
uh, the global challenge is that every every shire on the planet is trying to work out how they contribute to this. So so it's got to be done locally, but also we've got to lead the way and help others do it as well. So thanks again because this is this is in play and it's not decided how this turns out. In a, in our lifetime, it will be. So that's pretty. That's both good and confronting. Um, when it comes to climate, I love this quote from Andrew Watkins at the Bureau of Meteorology. You know, climate's what we expect; weather is what we'll get. And I want to talk about that because we're confident about the climate change projections and things getting warmer. But there's a few other things that perhaps there's more surprises potentially in store. So I like this picture. You can see Antarctica. You can see Australia here. And you know. We're, we're the result of the weather systems that crash and bump into one another above our heads. You know, we get lots of moisture from the tropics, from the Pacific Ocean, and uh, a La Nina this year sends a bit of extra moisture our way. And when it hits the cold air, you can see the, the southern annular mode, which is these really strong, the roaring 40s, those winds, and it, it drives all of the cold fronts that flick their tail across uh, southern Australia. It's actually when moisture feed comes in and hits that cold air, that actually makes rain happen. Um, if you didn't have that disturbance, you just have humid air. So you need moisture and then you need disturbance to actually make that rain fall out, which is why we have good, pretty reliable rainfall here. If you, uh, if you just, in simple physics, if you warm up the planet, what happens is the warmest part of the planet's at the equator, the coldest part is at the poles, and a lot of these really strong storm tracks and winds, they actually just shift polewards. You sort of squeeze, the temperature dynamics just squeezes weather patterns and climate zones southwards. So that's the really simple summary. So if you want to find someone farming one degree or two degrees warmer, you jump in a car and head a few hundred k's to the north. There's always people farming in warmer, dry climates, but they often do things quite differently. And also the amount of carbon in their landscape is different as well. The other thing is there's a, there's a lot of other potential things that happen with, with a warmer climate in terms of um, uh, extreme weather. <coughs> and often it's not captured well, but I'll give you an example. So these are the Victorian climate change projections that were just done in 2019. Um, and this is a simulated hot day for a high emissions future. I'm pretty, and it's as close as we can get to jumping in a time machine, having a look at 2015, coming back saying, hmm, I think we need to get on with this. So I'll just run through it. This is a temperature scale. This is daily maximum temperatures for an extreme heat day simulated under a high emission scenario where Melbourne reaches 50 degrees and even higher temperatures inland. Now they're saying there's a warm bias in the modelling here, they think, for the Gippsland coast. So it might be elevated. But they're saying, no, this is not the hottest day in simulations. It's just an indicative of a very hot day in future climate without any historic precedent. So, so that's, you know, in 30's time. So I was planting a tree today, you know, it's going to have to withstand that. But we can reduce the worst effects of this by, by strong action in the next 30 years. And hence why a lot of the net zero carbon ambition that um, governments and lots of corporates and others have, you know, it is game on. This is what we're trying to avoid. Um, always a real test for humans about a choice between doing something now or putting something off for later. Uh, so this really is going to attest to our intelligence um, if we can actually, you know, get on top of this early. <coughs> the other thing I'll just point out, just something um, a uh, scientist looking at um, rainfall intensity, um, Seth Westra, pointed out to me, which I thought was fascinating. If you warm up an atmosphere, and this is an example of... Um, uh, this is a, a, a the cone of the volume of rainfall in a thunderstorm that's, you know, quite warm. This is versus cooler. So it's about how warm the atmosphere is when a thunderstorm forms. But basically, if you warm up a thunderstorm, the actual, you, you increase, you can increase moisture feed, but actually more of that moisture falls out in a tighter cone, which is about rainfall intensity. It's just the, the physics of how that sort of um, thing works. So when you warm up the atmosphere, future weather events will have it will be a bit more exciting because you've got more heat driving the system, there's potentially more moisture when it's around, but it's going to fall out in a smaller zone. And then certainly a lot of farmers I speak to notice that, that rainfall intensity, which impacts on our, the past, you know, our soils and the importance of ground cover for soil erosion and those sort of things. So 
one of the things when they look at climate change projections, it talks about you know, the longer term projection, but some of the impacts of actually future weather aren't well captured. So, so we just don't want to poke the bear too much in terms of creating more energised weather systems. <coughs> um, so what are, we, what are we doing about it? Well, th to me, I like to use the three, the three Ps of the, you know, what we do and how it impacts us, the impacts of climate change. There's the physical effects of what the climate and weather does and wild weather and how it impacts farming and all of us. Um, but also a key consideration is the policy impacts of changes to you know, issues such as you know, water, drought policy, carbon trading, renewables, bushfire planning. All of those things have impacted all of us. You know, so it's not just the weather; it's actually how all of these other things will affect our business. You know, and also create business opportunities. So often we're, you know, that's that's there's a big contest here. There's also what's really changed, I think, in the last ten years is that, you know, ten years ago there was a lot of discussion around government and the need for emissions reduction. At the moment, it's m coming very heavily from industry, from investors from consumers, stakeholders, and that's a really big change. So, so there's lots of people wanting to get there, and there is, a, there is great opportunities for those that can do this. Like, that's, that's it, really important. Um, and we know we can do it. I was just looking at California's emissions the other day, and, you know, they're, as, a, as an individual state in America, but they're in the top ten, I think, economies of the world. And it's not about... Um, you know, declining economic growth and making our lifestyles poorer. This is about, you know, a, a prosperous future. That GDP can still grow, but we can. It's about how we tease out, making sure emissions isn't a part of what we do. And so, all sectors have to be involved. And food is no different. There's a real focus on how we can do that. We can still do it, but how do we do it with the low emissions? Um, Victoria has got a climate change strategy, and I've just got the web link there lot of activity, there's targets set for 2050, uh, 2030 and 2025 um, and a lot of investment happening there. So the, you know, that's really good. There's a, it's a good state to be in. Um, just, just for example, I think uh, the, the um, strategy was saying that we've got in 2019 Victoria's emissions were, they'd fallen 24% below 2005 levels. So that's pretty good. Um, the target for 2025 is between 28 and 33% reduction and 45 to 50% reduction by 2030. That's the that's pretty ambitious change, um, and a huge shift that's obviously happening with the energy sector. Um, but agriculture will do that, and it's interesting that you know that as the energy sector does sort of reduce its emissions, what do you think then happens to the proportion of the economy that say ag and food production um, might be for emissions? So it will go up. So there'll be a lot more people looking and saying, okay, well, what are we doing in agriculture? And there's been some great announcements this year um, with Ag Victoria too about what's happening with the agriculture sector pledge. So I've just put that there. There's a site there and there's going to be a lot more support and activity happening in this space. But if I just sort of looked at what do farmers do, you know, land care and all of the work that a lot of you have been involved in, um, it's, it's pretty much more of that, please, isn't it? Like... Uh, um, we know that you know the role of trees are really important, um, and all of the benefits that comes with that. But also, it's not just about planting trees and forgetting. Trees can bring carbon down to earth, and then if we can put it into products and use it, then you can grow more trees and do that again. So, so I think today we'll have some discussions around. It's not just this is not about trees and not doing anything. We're trying to bring incentivize how you bring carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into things and then bring more of it out and put it into things. That's the, the game. Um, we know soils and all of the benefits of having fantastic functioning soils and soil carbon. I think a real challenge for both of these is that, remember, the climate will warm in the, in the next few decades. So what we plant and how we maintain soil carbon, we're going to have the challenges there a mixed climate that's going to test us. We know energy is a key area on farms. We know that the nitrogen side of things are really important and livestock productivity and the sort of work that's underway to improve methane uh, efficiency. So there's a lot happening. Each of these action areas is like a gateway. You open them up and there's a paddock full of science, activities and practices that can all work for us. Uh, and lots more we still need. And when we talk about making change, I think this is a real challenge for, for those of us who work in climate change. 
there's a lot of talk and often a lot of concern, but it's time for actually converting that to action and actual changes that reduce emissions. And wherever we've seen adoption and practice change in the past, there's been these three, this is a simple rule of thumb, and was tested in the early days of salinity programs um, working with David. Um, but first of all, you've got to have something that's proven to work. Okay, so you can look at it and you can say, yep, that solar panel, it works, I can see how it's charging, the neighbours put it on, it's worked, that's great. The second thing, people have got to want to adopt it because it makes their life better or solve some problem. Often if you're completely satisfied with the current, you won't change. And the third is then I can, I can see it happening, I know someone's proven that this works, I want it and actually I've got someone who can deliver this to my place. So those three things, when they're there, we see major change and that's the challenge. And I reckon it's a good little rule of thumb to keep uh, keep in your back. And this is, I, I saw this yesterday, it popped up, it's been around for ages but I know a lot of land care people like it that, you know, <laughs> there's so many win-wins out of, out of these sort of practices we're trying to get. We're going to be better off for it. So today's about making decisions today that leave us better off in future. So enjoy the discussions and thanks heaps. Yeah, okay. So have we got any questions from the audience here that would ask, like to ask Graham? We do have one online that uh, we can, can add. If nobody here wants to ask any questions. Um, so from Jared Grasser. Turn this on. Jared uh, has asked, rainfall and temperature are largely influenced by vegetation density mainly trees, is the data that links the long-term trend of vegetation removal to the various environmental parameters? Yeah, um, good question. I, I think certainly uh, vegetation has a big impact locally and in microclimates, but, but one of the big things, the big driver that determines why, it, why it, it's, you know, the coast here we get a lot of rainfall, but if you go to Sejuna, it doesn't. It's actually about the intersection of the big climate drivers that are crashing above our heads. So those strong westerly winds, the southern annular mode, and those cold fronts that swing through us. I mean, as you head north in inland Australia, that they get moisture passing over their heads, but it doesn't fall on them as rain. So, so there's the big climate drivers, but we enhance that by the microclimates we create on our farms. So that's why, um, and wind is one of the biggest desiccators around. So. Farm shelter is such a valuable thing for what effective rainfall and moisture you have by, you know, keeping the worst of the winds off your farm. So, and as we know, we've seen this year, trees get hammered by wind themselves. Like, so they need enough company to try and withstand that as well. But, yeah, so it's a combination. So it's, it's always helpful. Always helpful. Thank you. And we've got a question here, and I'll just bring the mic over. Thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to ask what the climate app that you were using earlier when you were um, yep. referencing the local rainfall. What was the name of that app? Oh, it's called Climate, um, but it's um, climateapp.net.au. Yep. It was developed by the Managing Climate Variability Program and it's got lots of long-term rainfall records and you click on it and, and uh, you can sort of see history. You can also ask it, you know, how often do we get uh, um, 100 mil in November? and it'll uh, tell you how often that's happened in the past. So it's a great little app. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, yep, climateapp.net.au, I'm pretty sure. I had it on that slide. Um, so all the presentations are going to be available great. online, yep. so people can have a look on them and then yep. click on that that's online. Climateapp.net.au. So most of those slides, I've got a, a website or a link to each of them. So, so it was a bit pretty quick, but it's a pretty big issue, this whole trying to summarise the globe in <laughs> 20 minutes. But I think we've hopefully got there. Okay, another question here. Hi, thanks, Graeme. Great presentation. Um, we're getting drier, we're getting warmer fire. Um, on the peninsula, we are surrounded by amazing trees and bush. Yep we are getting more densely populated and the future, if we're looking at how many people are going to be moving down here, so there's going to have to be a certain percentage of clearing. How do we... Trees are an important part of the whole cycle of carbon. Um, so how do we balance between keeping our incredible resources down here 
but protecting our farms, our vineyards, our people. Yep. Uh, that that is a that is an actual you know, ripper question because we were talking recently in northeast Victoria about that about how you know we there's a desire to have more trees back in the landscape and good for biodiversity and all of that but also you know on the, in the wrong situations vegetation and fire risk is increasing so how we manage those two is going to be really important and often we'll find a lot of conflict at a community level where someone's saying no you can't do that and saying no but we have to because we're living here that's the sort of stuff that's going to require us to resolve that about how do we how do we do that because the climate is going to be less friendly from a fire point of view so where are the safe places where it's good to have vegetation and where isn't it yeah so that's 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 an active question and i think one of the key bits is a lot of these issues have some uh, there is no one answer. You have to work together to work out what's going to be best for us that's safe for people, but also, you know, how do we help make sure we've got more trees in the right spot in the landscape? So, because there's, there's no shortage of, you know, plantings people have put in that were good, but trees get bigger, and then say, you know what, there was probably, probably a better spot we could have put them. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really good example. And the same, like, even with energy and transmission lines and all that stuff, with this change comes, it's quite a disruption on lots of levels. And so um, I know we have lots of change which we're saying this is a good thing, but all of a sudden when it's happening in your community and you're impacted in various ways, that takes really strong leadership about, well, how do we sort this out? We know we, it's got to happen, but uh, it's, it's perhaps going to surprise us in some way. So how do we, it's going to take a lot of leadership to n negotiate that locally. And we've got mm. one a final question, question here. for you up the back here. There you go. Graham, I just wanted to ask about the effect of urbanisation on the on the weather pattern because where we are, we're 50 kilometres from the city when we started and now it's only 10 kilometres away and increasingly what we see is the storms are coming in from the west and they seem to hit the bay and then follow the bay. I'm just wondering if this, the big mass of urbanisation which is there, which generally is a burnt earth policy with nothing living left, no gardens what's that how's that going to affect our rainfall yeah well um uh, i think there's certainly the microclimate stuff of urban um and you know and if there's lots of black roofs and all that sort of thing it, it can and really add especially to heat um absorption of landscape so urban planning has a big role to play with softening the landscape and more greenery and shade and all of that sort of thing so there's some pretty important work happening there i think in the bigger system, the rain events that are coming overhead, um, uh, that's, that's probably not going to affect it so much, but it will affect what happens at that local climate level. Yeah. So I, I do think the more you have greater temperature in pockets and then you have cold weather coming over it, the more exciting. So there is some microclimate effects, but, but I think we're really after, you know, how far we don't want this, the, the cold fronts to slip too much further south over the next 30 years because that really weakens... Um, you know, that reliability of the weather, the rainfall events that we get. So this year's been a good year where there's been plenty of them, um, but some years, you know, they can be a bit sparse. And where are they? They're, they're still happening, they're just for too far south. Well, thank you, Graham. Really great setting the scene. Yes, I will, yeah. Um, so thanks, Graham, and we'll thank him. Yep.